Okay, so let's go to the theory of chromatographic separations. So in this module, okay, uh, we're going to define what chromatography is, describe ways of categorizing the types of chromatography, discuss the terms that are used to describe retention, bond broadening, and peak separations in chromatography. We're also going to discuss the significance of bond dimter equation in bond broadening and summarize the factors that affect the resolution of a separation in chromatography. Okay, so if we're going to look at the history of chromatography, everything has something to do with uh, Mikhail Tisweb or Michael Tisweb. He's a, an Italian born Russian botanist and he's now considered as the father of chromatography. So what did he do is observe the pigments and the separation of colored, okay, observe the effects of the separation of the colored plant pigments into bonds using different materials in the column and the material of different size. And if we're going to look the type of chromatography that he did, it's the uh, so-called adsorption chromatography, okay? So Tisuet presented the first official lecture on chromatographic separation at the Warsaw Society of uh, Natural Scientists on March 21, 1903. And he coined the term chromatography, okay? Uh, which means color and right. Now, if we're going to look at the definition of chromatography, the IUFAC defined is as a physical method of separation in which the components to be separated are distributed between two phases, one which is stationary, okay, which we call the stationary phase, while the other one is the mobile phase, which moves in a definite direction, okay? Uh, if we're going to look at this thing about chromatography, we could say it's a very useful method. And if we're going to look at the different uh, classification of chromatography, we can classify it either as a planar chromatography or column chromatography. So planar chromatography, these are the type of chromatography that you did in organic chemistry. So if you did the in-person uh, laboratory experiments in 43, you, you have the uh, techniques on paper chromatography and thin layer chromatography. So it's just like they're on a plane and then you spot your sample and then you put the solvent and then it will arise to give you the different bonds, okay? Now, column chromatography, on the other hand, so you have here a column wherein you put some materials and then you pass through your sample it where separation takes place, depending on the interaction of the components and your uh, sample with the materials that was placed inside the column. So it could be a liquid-liquid chromatography, or if you're going to look at the column chromatography, it could be gas chrome, supercritical fluid chromatography and liquid chromatography. So the difference in the uh, in this uh, what we call different column chromatography has something to do with the mobile phase. Okay, so if it's gas chromatography, the mobile phase is gas and it can be divided into the gas solid chromatography, gas liquid chromatography and gas bonded phase chromatography. If the mobile phase is a supercritical fluid, then it's a supercritical fluid chromatography. If it's liquid, then it's liquid chromatography. And in the liquid chromatography, there's a liquid-liquid chromatography that's mostly partition. Okay, uh, you can also have a liquid-solid uh, chromatography, which is adsorption, and then you have ion exchange. Okay. Uh, taking advantage of the charges that you have in your samples, uh, size exclusion. So it has something to do with the molecular weight and the affinity. So this is something to do with the specific uh, target or a ligand that target a specific uh, compound or chemical. 
So if you're going to look at the major variants of the chromatography, you can do it in terms of the mobile phase. You have liquid gas and supercritical fluid. You can do it in terms of mechanism of retention. You can have absorption, partition, bonded phase, ion exchange, and exclusion. You can also look at it as an incoming solute profile. It can be sonal, frontal, or linear. Okay. And as we have discussed earlier, it can be column or planar. So if it's a column, it can be a pack or capillary column. If it's planar, it can be paper or thin layer chromatography. In terms of the gradients, okay, uh, it, gets, it can be non-gradient or isocratic, or it could be gradient illusion, which is uh, in terms of gas chromatography, is so a program temperature, okay? or a chroma thermograph at uh, chro chroma thermography as a program flow. Okay, so this means the composition of the mobile phase changes if it's gradient or it's the same throughout or constant if it's uh, isocratic. Dimensionality, uh, it can be one dimensional chromatography or two dimensional chromatography. In terms of the physical scale, you can do a microbar standard or preparative scale in nature. So those are, we could say, the different uh, physical scale uh, in terms of the variance that we have uh, here in chromatography. So let's discuss about the mobile phase. So if we're going to look at the mobile phase, so that's a fluid which percolates through or along the stationary bed in a definite direction. There's a liquid in liquid chromatography, gas in gas chromatography, and supercritical fluid in supercritical fluid chromatography. In GC, the mobile phase okay, is known by the expression carrier gas. And illusion chromatography, the expression LUN is also used for the mobile phase. So when we're talking about the LUN, usually it refers to the mobile phase. Now, on the other hand, if we're going to look at the stationary phase, okay, there are one of the two phases forming a chromatographic system, and it can be a solid, a gel, or a liquid. Now, the liquid may also be chemically bonded to the solid, or we have the term bonded phase or immobilized into it as we call immobilized phase, okay? Now, there's also the term that's used for stationary phase as chromatographic bed or sorbent, okay? They use it as a, what we call a general term. Now, in chromatography, we usually have this so-called uh, chromatogram, which is just a graphical or other presentation of detector response, concentration of analyte in the effluent or other quantity uses a measure of effluent concentration versus effluent volume of, uh, or time. So chromatogram is just a plot of the detector's response as a result or as a function of elution time or as a function of the volume of the mobile phase. In uh, planar chromatography, chromatogram may refer to the paper or layer with the separated zone. So in HPLC, the chromatogram would look like this. So you will see some peaks. In uh, planar chromatography, you will see some bands coming up or separating okay, from one another. Okay. Now, if we're going to look at the basic uh, separation principles and terms, okay, the way that we look at the separation that happened here is the compounds or the analytes are separated from a mixture by passing them through a stationary phase using a mobile phase carrier. Okay, so if we're going to look at this Chromatography is just used when there is a difference in the retention times of the different components. How do they differ in the retention times? It depends on the interaction of the compounds that you have between the mobile phase and the stationary phase. 
Separation occur because analyzing the mobile phase interact with the stationary phase at different times. And this produced varying migration rates for the analyze. The migration rates that we have there, that is your retention uh, time. Now, what are the factors that can affect the retention? Well, it is something to do with the composition and properties of mobile phase. So sometimes, okay, when the mobile phase bring the samples or the compounds through the stationary phase, the comp some compounds have greater affinity to the mobile phase and they would elute faster or earlier compared to the compound that has less affinity with the mobile phase. In addition, the type and properties of stationary phase also play a very good, a very important factor. If the stationary phase has greater affinity with some compounds, these compounds will elude at a much later time, or they have a longer retention time. Now, how do the interaction that happen? Well, it depends on how the components interact with the uh, uh, intermolecular forces. Okay, so the stationary phase and the mobile phase composition will play a role here. Okay, and in GC, temperature plays a very important factor. It's the uh, for GC temperatures controlling factor are the choice of the stationary phase and the temperature of the given column. So those are the factors that affect. Uh, we could say the retention or the retention time. So the type and properties of stationary phase, the composition and properties of the mobile phase, okay? the intermolecular forces between the analyte and the mobile phase, and the analyte and the stationary phase, and the temperature, like the boiling point. Okay. Now, there could be another other factors. For instance, if you have this uh, molecular size, so that's another factors that you uh, take into consideration. But it just all depends on the molecular size. Okay. So, how does separation takes place? So, imagine let's say you have some bees. No. Oh. And if you have some bees, okay, let's say the bees contains what, uh, the, the bees and the wasps are together. So if you pass through a flowers or some flowers, which one will stay longer in the flower? So usually it's the bees, the wasps will just pass over. So it's the same thing that's happened when you do this uh, separation. So in, in the example that we have here, uh, the column illusion chromatography, so this is similar to what PC would did. So everyone, okay, all uh, components in the given samples are all together. And then when they pass through a packed column, you will see that some of them will be retained at a much longer time in the packed column, and some of them will elute at a much faster time. So the green color has the shortest retention time. So if we're going to look at this, that's the one that doesn't interact strongly with the stationary phase, or it can uh, interact strongly with the mobile phase. And then followed by the red one, okay? And the blue one. So the blue one, you could say, they have the greatest interaction with the stationary phase. Hence, they are the last one to come out or to elute. Okay. Now, if we're going to look at the basis of the separation principle, we could say it's just similar to the liquid ex liquid extraction that we have already discussed. You still remember that? I think last week, right? We discussed the liquid liquid extraction. So it's similar to liquid liquid extraction, but one phase is immobilized, and that is your stationary phase. Okay. It is immobilized on a solid support. Now the mobile phase that you have there constantly flows through a column containing the stationary phase. 
And if you're going to look at the separation, it depends, uh, it, it depends on the extent to which the solute partition between the mobile phase and the stationary phase. So this is not new to you. Okay. So you have here a partition coefficient K where you look at the activity of solute A in the stationary phase over the activity of solute A in the mobile phase. But since we don't commonly use uh, activity, we could just say the concentration in the stationary phase and the concentration of, of, on the what we call mobile phase. That's the partition coefficient. And if we're going to look at it, the solute will elute in order of their increasing distribution coefficients with respect to the stationary phase. Okay. So the solute, they will elute in the order of their increasing distribution coefficient. So that, what, what does it mean that the, the, the higher is the affinity or the greater is the interaction that they have in the stationary phase the later that they will be eluted. So if there is uh, what we call the uh, less distribution coefficient, so they will elute faster. Okay. Now there are some terms that we need to go over in this uh, what we call chromatography. So one is the retention time, it's TR. So retention time is the time it takes for after injection for a solute to reach a detector. Okay, so here the retention time is this one. So that's the time where the one that you inject, where there's a standard or the sample, will come out. Now we also have this so-called dead time. In some books they call it the void, void time. Okay, B O I D. Okay, or hold up time. Okay, so this is the time for the unretained species to reach the detector. So this is the time required to elute non-retained species. Okay, so usually that's the one that you have here. Dead time. Why, why do you call this dead time? Because usually that's your mobile phase. The unretained species that you have. Okay, now in some books they put TR equals to pm plus ps okay so sorry i cannot uh, write this thing properly here i'm trying to do some sort of an annotation so what what is uh what we call tr equals to TM over TS. So what is TS? TS is the time that was spent in the mobile, uh, in the stationary phase. Okay, so if you're going to look at this TS, that's the time duration of the analyte retained in the mobile phase. Okay, some book are uh, what we could include in that term. Now, another term that we have here is the so-called mobile phase velocity, which is mu. So usually that's equals to the length of the chromatographic column divided by the void volume. That's the average linear rate of movement of molecules in the mobile phase. Okay. And synonymous to this is the linear rate of solute migration, which is L over the retention time. And this is the average linear rate of solute migration. Okay. So if you're going to look at the, uh, what we call relationship between the two, maybe I need to use some whiteboard here. So if you're going to look at the relationship between the two here, so the, re, the, the li, linear rate of solute migration is just equals to the mobile phase velocity times the fraction of time solute spends in mobile phase. So, so that's the relationship that you have between the linear rate of solute migration and the mobile phase velocity. Okay, so in order to uh, relate 
the retention time of a solute to its distribution constant, we can express its migration rate as a fraction of the velocity of the mobile phase. Okay. Now, what other terms that we can use here? So I have to go back. So this exercise, I think we can do it during the synchronous one. So what other terms that we have? We have this so-called retention factor or capacity factor. So it's described as what we call K. Put this. Okay, so if we're going to look at the re re retention factor, it's used to compare the migration rates of solutes in column. Retention factor is one way to quantify a column's ability to separate to analyze. Okay, so if we're going to look at the uh, look at this, this one way to quantify a column's ability. Column, we could say that's the heart of chromatography. That's where separation takes place, okay? So we can determine the retention factor using this formula, the most of A in station, uh, solute A in stationary phase over the most of solute A in mobile phase. So we can do it like this one concentration times the volume stationary phase, concentration times the volume of the mobile phase. And we have your what C, S over CM, that's K. So all you need to do is the volume stationary phase over the volume in the mobile phase. Now, if we're going to get the retention factor directly from the chromatogram, we're going to use this formula where the retention factor is equals to the difference in the retention time minus okay, the dead time or the void uh, time over the uh, what we call void volume or the void time that you have. So that's, uh, we could say how you get this thing from the chromatogram, retention time minus dead time over the dead time. Or we could say your T here becomes your adjusted retention time when you subtract your retention time with the dead time, okay? Now for dynamic distribution in chromatography, we often use retention factor instead of this capacity factor. Now, another way of what we could look, looking at this retention factor is we often uh, neither know, okay, we, we often know neither the volume ratio uh, nor the volumes of the two phases in the chromatography. But if we have the K, okay, we can define the capacity factor or the retention factor based on the retention time, like what we did here. And we could say your retention factor can be used to predict the efficiency of your separation. Now we're going to have some sample calculations that's it during our asynchronous time. So what is the information that we can get okay, in the retention factor? So if the retention factor is less than one, we could say the illusion is too rapid for accurate determination of the retention time. If the retention factor is approximately 10, the illusion is too slow to be practical. So the preferred range that you want would be a retention factor between one and five. Okay. Now, another thing that we need to do is the so-called selectivity factor or the relative retention factor. So if you're going to look at this, uh, what we call term, 
this is just the distribution or we could say uh, selectivity factor is one way that allow us to estimate how easily we can resolve two components. We can define selectivity factor or the term that they use here, relative retention in terms of the retention factor of B divided by retention factor of uh, in A. Okay, where KB is the distribution constant of the more strongly retained species. So what does it mean? Okay, your selectivity factor should always be greater than one. So you're going to put in the uh, numerator, the more strongly retained solute. Okay, and the less strongly retained solute is placed in the denominator. Okay, so the thing or the information that we get here, as I've mentioned uh, earlier, it allows us to estimate how easily we can resolve two components. Now, if we're going to look at this uh, selectivity factor, we can define it in terms of the chromato uh, chromatogram parameters. Okay, so the one that you have here as the definition here, we can do it in terms of the retention time minus the dead time of component B over the retention time of component A minus the dead time. And then again, Okay. you want B to be the longer retention time over A. Okay. All, uh, we could say the selectivity factor is always greater than unity. It's always greater than one. Now we go back to uh, another term that we have, the so-called plate theory in chromatography. So this was introduced in the paper by Martin and since in 1940s. Okay. In the plate theory, it says there that the chromatographic system is at equilibrium between the stationary and the mobile phase. And the column is divided into a number of the so-called theoretical plates. It's just what we call imaginary. Okay, so in this classical chromatographic theory, the separation happens in N, letter N, oh no, okay, uh, discrete steps or what we call plates. And if we're going to look at the information that we have here as the number of plates or the N in a column increases, okay as the number of plates in a column increases or the height equivalent theoretical plate decreases, so does the separation of the component. So if you're going to look at this, the higher the end, the sharper is the peaks, hence the higher is the column efficiency or the lower the height equivalent theoretical plates, okay, the better we could say is the separation of the component. Now, if we're going to follow the Gaussian distribution, assuming that the Gaussian distribution or normal distribution is followed, the theoretical plate number is represented by this formula, okay? So you have N equals to the retention time divided by the standard deviation raised to the two. So the standard deviation that you have here is based on this one. So if we're going to look at the information that we get from this uh, standard deviation, so we could say one standard deviation is from here to here. Two standard deviation would be around what? From here going here. So it's occupied for standard deviation. So that's around 95.5% of all the areas that's covered, okay? 
So we, we look at in terms of the width of the base is equals to four uh, sigma because it has the two negative standard deviation and the two positive standard deviation. Now, if we're going to substitute okay, uh, to n expression, what happened from our n equals to retention time over the sigma, what you will have here now, okay, if we replace that sigma, so sigma is just equals to what? Wb over four. Now, if you're going to replace this Wb over four, so square root, uh, no, uh, four raised to the squared is equals to 16, okay? So we, 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 we isolate 16 on one side, so retention time over the width of the base squared times 16, that is the number of plates that you have. Now it's often more practical to measure the peak width at half height, the W1 half height, and they found it to be 2.34, uh, 2.354 times sigma. Okay, and if you substitute it to the n expression, so instead of using what the one that we have earlier, 16 times retention time over the width base. Okay, you can put it as 5.54 times retention time divided by the peak width of half height raised to the second power. So maybe during the calculation, we can discuss more about this one. Now we also look at this so-called uh, asymmetry of peaks. So if you have a Gaussian distribution, you have a symmetrical shape there. But they found out that some of the molecules are what we call not exhibiting their symmetry. Some of them, some molecules are retained more in the stationary phase than the predicted K or distribution coefficient. And what you have there is the so-called tailing. Okay, so tailing occurs when some sites on the stationary phase retain solute more strongly than the other sites. Now fronting on the, so tailing is the one that you have here. So you should see it's not symmetrically uh, in shape. Some of these, uh, what we call compound are uh, retained more by the stationary phase. Fronting, on the other hand, it occurs when some molecules uh, move ahead of the main band due to the less expected retention by the stationary phase. So fronting most often is the result of what? Overloading the column with sample, just like this one. Okay. Now, we can look at the tailing factor or sym uh, symmetry factor. So this is just the coefficient that shows the degree of peak symmetry, okay? So the, they use the so-called the USP tailing factors. This is just measured at 5% of the peak height. And this is equals to the width 0 0.005 over 2F. So the information that you get here, if your S is more than one, you have tailing. If your S is equals to one, then you have what? a Gaussian distribution, a symmetrical shape. But if your S is less than one, you have a leading peak. Or we could say fronting peak. Okay. Now, alternatively, we can look at the tailing factor at 5% of the peak height, like this one, A plus B over 2A. Okay. And again, the same information that we can have. Uh, S value over one is tailing peak. S equals to one, that's Gaussian distribution or symmetrical. S less than one is what we call the leading peak. Now in terms of the, uh, uh, you can read more further about this one in the link here provided by Shimatsu, okay? Now, in terms of the asymmetry factor, asymmetry is a width at 10% of peak height. So that's just asymmetry 
uh, equals to b over a. And if we have this, what we call factor to consider, we can now have the modification of the number of theoretic light rays for an asymmetric peak shape. And this is approximately the theoretical plate is equal to 41.7 retention time over with a 0.1 squared or retention time over A plus B over B minus A of B divided by A plus 1.25 or the asymmetric factor plus 1.25. We seldom do this thing, but at least you're familiar what this asymmetry factor is. Now, Let's go on the kinetic theory in chromatography. So this pertains shortly to the so-called Van Dimter equation. So this is developed and reported by Van, Van Dimter okay, in 1956. And it's still currently in use to explain the behavior uh, of your sample when they undergo separation. Okay, so the Van Dimter equation accounts for the dynamics of the separation. And you have to take into consideration some factors that can affect this thing. The thickness of the stationary phase, the nature of the analyte, the nature of the stationary phase and the movement phase, and then the column length and diameter, okay? So as we have learned so far, the plate height is proportional to the variance of a chromatographic band. The smaller the plate height, the narrower the band. And if we're going to look at this chromatographic efficiency, it can be explained by this Van Dimter equation, which is equals to H, which is the plate height, equals to A. That's the coefficient that describes the multiple path effects plus B over mu, so B is the longitudinal, uh, long, longitudinal diffusion of the coefficient, okay? So mu is the linear velocity of the mobile phase, plus C times U. So C is the mass transfer coefficients of, or for the stationary phase and the mobile phase. So usually one Dimter uh, model, okay, some sort describes why column broadening happen. You may ask yourself, why do bands spread? So those are the three factors that affect this so-called undimper equation. The multiple flow path or the eddy diffusion, the longitudinal diffusion, and then the resistance to mass transfer, okay? Now, if you don't have none, uh, what we call non-column broadening, we could say the dispersion of the analyte is good. The dead volume of the injector, the connection between these, uh, what we call injector and column. So we could say it's fine, but what, why does bond broaden? What have, what, what's the one responsible for this column broadening? So the first thing that we can look here is the so-called the atom, the multiple flow path, or the eddy diffusion. So this is a process that leads to peak or band broadening due to the presence of multiple flow paths through a pack column. What is the meaning of this? Molecules may travel unequal distances. And the larger differences in the path lengths are observed for larger particles, okay? So if you're going to look at this, uh, what we call the Van Dimter equation that you have here, okay? It's just the unequal traveling that they have when they pass through this so-called column. So if we look at this uh, 
eddy diffusion, it relates to the different paths uh, analyte uh, molecules might take uh, to the stationary phase support material. So from this initial band profile where it's so narrow, so you could see there, they have multiple flow path there that's distribute or contribute to the band broadening of your chromatogram. Now, eddy diffusion is not affected by the mobile phase flow rate. Okay, it's more possible that the paths leads to the greater uh, peak broadening. But you can minimize uh, the band broadening caused by eddy diffusion by using small uniformly packed stationary phase particles. However, smaller particles would also lead to the so-called tighter packing. So greater pressures are needed. So if, if you're going to use smaller particles, you're going to use, uh, you're going to need high pressure, okay? To push the mobile phase through the column. So this one contribution of band broadening okay due to eddy diffusion or the multiple uh, flow path now another thing that we can see in the band dimter equation is the so-called longitudinal diffusion so the b term that we have okay so if we have the b term this longitudinal longitudinal diffusion it's a band broadening due to the diffusion of the solute along the length of the column in the flowing mobile, says, uh, mobile phase. It's the diffusion from the zones, from the tail, uh, from the front and the tail. If you're going to look at it. And they said it depends on the diffusion of the solute and the flow rate of the solute through the column. We can also say, uh, Longitudinal diffusion is proportional okay, to the mobile phase diffusion coefficient. So what does it mean? The smaller the viscosity, the faster is the diffusion. And it can be said that it's inversely proportional also to the flow rate. Okay, so they are dependent on this one. So the lower the viscosity or the smaller the viscosity, the faster is the diffusion. Okay, in terms of the flow rate of the solute to the column, uh, column, it's inversely proportional to the flow rate. High flow, less time for diffusion. Okay, and the V terms is usually, we could say dominates at low uh, mu or at low uh, velocity. What's the, the, the mu that we have here, okay? Linear velocity. Now, if we're going to go further with the longitudinal diffusion, it's a natural diffusion from a region of high concentration or the center of the band to low concentration, which is beyond the band, okay? And it always occurs, even though we says it depends on the flow rate. It always uh, occurs to, uh, regardless of the flow rate. So the way to do it, higher flow rate, less time in column, so lower band broadening, okay? Now the third one, just going to let this go. So the third one, this is the, Resistance to mass transfer, the C term. Okay. So what uh, what uh, happened to this resistance to the mass transfer is the band broadening due to the finite uh, uh, equilibration time between the uh, between phases. So you can have a stagnant mobile phase mass transfer or a stationary phase mass transfer. Okay. So in the C term, it accounts for the finite time for mass transfer. So equal 
uh, between analyte and stationary phase and mobile phase not instantaneous. Okay, so we could say we can look at the CS here, the concentration in the stationary phase. That's the rate for the absorption onto stationary phase. And then the CM that we have here, that's the rate for the analyte to be sorbed from stationary phase. So the effect is proportional to the flow rate. At high flow rates, less time to approach equilibrium. So what really happened, if you have high flow rate, it causes the analyte uh, molecules in the mobile phase to move away from those partition into the stationary phase and resulting in the increase in the broadening, okay? So if you're going to represent the Van Dimter equation, oh, before doing that, we also have to look at the, uh, what we call the ideal equilibrium, the, the Gaussian profiles for the solute in mobile phase and the stationary phase. So if we're going to look at here, the movement of the solute's bond with the mobile phase, this, this straps the equilibrium. And as indicated here, so this is because the system of equilibrium. So this is the ideal one that you want, okay? But when you go to B and C, so you see the red uh, arrow there, that's what we call the disruption, okay? So the solute moves from the stationary phase to the mobile phase, and from the mobile phase to the stationary phase, they try to establish equilibrium. So there's some movement of the solute bond with the mobile phase, which disrupts the equilibrium. And what they're trying to do is they try to what we call establish equilibrium. So maybe we could say, if you know the, remember the concept of equilibrium, the system was uh, under stress, causing the disruption in equilibrium, but what happened is they will try to establish the equilibrium. But when they reestablish this, what will happen? If you're going to compare this one to this, this is now more broad compared to the one that you have here. So that's the bond broadening caused by the mass transfer. Now, if you're going to look at the bond dimter equation, this is how it looks like. So the total H is this one, the black one. And the A is usually a constant, okay? And then B over U would have a plot like this one and C of U is a little bit increasing. So the H, the height equivalent to the theoretical phase, they will change okay, with respect to the linear velocity or the flow rate of the mobile phase. The total H grows to a minimum value for a certain value of linear velocity. And they said it's best to operate the chromatographic column at or near its flow rate, okay? Uh, to achieve the least broadening and the highest resolution. So that's the best way that you're going to do. Best to operate the column, the chromatographic column at or near its optimal flow rate or the so-called <clears throat> linear velocity of the thing. <clears throat> so this exercise, so what does this all tell us? Or what, what does this all uh, lead us to? So everything would lead us to this so-called column resolution. So when we're talking about the resolution, of the column, it allow us to quantify the quality of the separation. Resolution is the quant uh, quantitative measure of the ability of a column to separate two analytes. And we can have it like a formula like this one. Resolution is equal to two times the difference in the retention times of a uh, B and A over the width of A and B. So if you're going to look at the one here, so this is your A, this is your B, so that's your retention time. And then you divide it over the width that they have here. 
And the RS value of 1.5 corresponds to an overlap of only 0.13 for two elution, elution profile. Okay. And if you're going to look at how the resolution is affected, okay, you have to take into consideration this thing. You can increase the resolution by increasing the length of the column. Now, the only limitation for that is you're going to have longer time and broader bonds. So usually there's a compromise between the resolution and the speed of analysis. The longer the column, the better separation that you have, but the longer the time it will take. And the longer the time it will take, it will give you longer analysis. Okay, so if you're going to look at the uh, column resolution, you can at least look at some factors that it is dependent on, okay? You can look at the K, which is your retention factor. You can look at the selectivity factor and you can look at the overall efficiency of the column. So if you're going to look at this, okay? When you're looking at this resolution, you look at some of the thermodynamic factors. The thermodynamic factors is, uh, is what we call dictated by retention factor. If you're going to look at the kinetic factors, it has something to do with the mobility of the analyze between phases. So rapid kinetics can allow separation with similar KD when slow kinetics might compromise separation of analyte with high K or KD, okay? So if we're going to look at this resolution following this Fresnel equation, there are three factors that leads to chromatographic separation, the efficiency, selectivity, and retention. A summarize here. So if you're going to combine them, okay, so this is the efficiency where the number of theoretical fate is included. In terms of selectivity, you have the selectivity factor here. In terms of retention, you have here the retention factor. Okay, so you have to take into consideration all of these. Uh, factors to give you the overall resolution. Now, the, the thing that it has there, what's the number of what we call the resolution number that we have to say we have a good resolution? Okay, the rule of thumb that they have is 1.5. So if we have a resolution of 1.5, it yields ba ba baseline resolution without excessive time loss, okay? So if you can have a value of, let's say higher than 1.5, then the separation is a little bit good. And what happened if your resolution is too high, maybe you can shorten the column, okay? or you can increase the temperature if you're using what we call the GC. You increase also the flow rate if the resolution is so high, okay? What you do is you just need to shorten the analysis. So in general, if we're going to look at the separation or column efficiency, okay, it increases when N increases, that's the number of plate and the height, like, uh, equivalent to theoretical plate decreases, okay? So how does the particle size of packing materials affect as the size increase, uh, decreases, your N increases and your H decreases. So in that case, column efficiency increases. If you have immobilized film thickness as the film become thicker or uh, less thicker or 
as the thing becomes thinner, okay, it also increases the column efficiency. The main reason there's the faster diffusion rates in the film. If you have less viscous mobile phase, okay, your N or, uh, also increases and column efficiency also increases. In terms of the temperature, okay, uh, as temperature, your capacity, uh, no, the tension factor, but your selectivity factor would remain uh, approximately constant. Okay. <clears throat> the linear velocity of your mobile, which is the mu, we could say this is proportional to one over the uh, void volume because L is what we call constant. And in terms of the column length, as the length and N, okay, uh, increases, but height is what we call constant and separation efficiency. So the, the, the way that we look at this, the longer it is, the better, but it's something to do with the efficiency. You also have longer time, okay? So I think this is what, this chapter is all about. So you can look at Libre text here. They gave you in-depth explanation of the thing. And as usual, uh, we're going to have quizzes. I think we're going to have at least three quizzes for this module starting this week.